Okay, I guess we can start. So, thank you for coming, uh, or maybe in other words, uh, thank you for uh, taking care of the quality. I assume all of you are testing. So, uh, I also assume that you find testing hard in C++, yay or nay? I think it's difficult, so today we'll try to make it a bit easier. Uh, so I'm Chris, I work for QuantLab, which is a high-frequency trading firm. So you may think, why we talk about testing, not about you know, high-performance stuff, how to you know, get nanoseconds out of our software. Well, let me tell you a story about high-frequency trading. So you might be the fastest on the market, but if you do the wrong decisions, you'll be the fastest to get out of the market because, <laughs> because nanoseconds count and there is no such a thing like panic button in the, uh, in the trading system because you're doing everything automatically and so fast. So, so in other words, uh, the only way to, uh, to go fast is to go well. And uh, this is a quote from Uncle Bob. Who read Uncle Bob, clean code? Yeah, all of you should. Uh, if you haven't, it's an awesome book, uh, how to design uh, good software. So, so here, the idea is that a lot of people think that testing is slowing you down because you have to write the tests, and you know, it takes time. However, in the long term, if you don't write the test, you'll spend 10 times more debugging, uh, which some people say that is the real coding, uh, or something like that. So, so if you want to avoid that, uh, I think you should test. So we'll try to look into the ways how, how we can actually make it happen. So what we'll talk about today? Well, obviously, we'll talk about testing. Uh, we'll talk about why we should test and how and when. So we'll talk a bit about frameworks, mocking, how to write testable code, uh, how to make it even easier. We'll talk about TDD, BDD. Uh, we'll have a showcase, and we'll take a look into C++20 for the future. Uh, so, why testing is important? Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, C++ uh, developers unfortunately think that we don't have to really test because we are hardcoder developers, uh, so we know what we are doing. But obviously, that's not, a, that's not the truth. So, all in all, it's all about money. If you don't test, you'll spend more and much money in the end. So, here is a graph where you can see that uh, depending on where you find the bug, how costly it will be. So if you find a bug in the requirement or design, implementation on the test is relatively not that costful as in the production. So if you test only in production, well, you'll have to deal with the, uh, the cost, on that, uh, cost of that. So uh, getting fired, we have different, uh, you know, tests, we have different uh, types of tests, and the class, first class tests are currently to uh, uh, Uncle Bob are acceptance tests, integration tests, and unit tests. So unit tests are the tests which we write the most as programmers. They test in isolation, we use mocks and everything like that, which we'll talk about. After that, you have the integration or plumbing test, where you, they sometimes are written by programmers, sometimes they are written by architects, depends how you look at it. Uh, they definitely, they basically, the idea is to check the configuration between the components because TDD, uh, like unit test, needs to do that. And after that, you have acceptance tests, uh, which are written by the business so that you can verify whether the product is actually working and doing what, you, what the business wants or not. So you have to have all of those kind of tests. There are obviously different types of tests too, but that's the main focus on, on Bistock. So, uh, here we have a graph when, you, when we see the cost depending on the test and where we find the bug. So if you find the bug in the unit testing, well, easy to fix. I, I, I fix the code, I fix the unit test. If you do TDD, it's even better. When we have integration tests, the cost is a bit higher because it's harder to find uh, uh, the bug in the integration test uh, because it's more going on. Acceptance tests as well. And obviously in the maintenance production, it's, it's just way harder. It depending on your deployment and everything, it might be impossible sometimes. So, my advice would be for that, just don't cling to, 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 you know, to mistakes just because you spend a lot of time and money making it. Meaning, if you don't test, change everything because uh, if you want, you, you end up uh, debugging the code and you'll just waste a lot of money. Mm. 
And I hope you agree with, with that. So, so there are ways to, to go about it. And uh, uh, just to let you know that this talk is uh, in, in the spirit of uh, don't give me problems, give me solutions. So I will have a c concrete solution for everything. Uh, may, might, might not be the best solutions, but that the solutions I think are uh, achievable right now and really good for the C++ from different reasons. So, so first is the quality. Tests have to improve the quality of the code. If you write the tests which don't test anything and just point that are pointless, there's no point of writing them. Uh, I, obviously, that is like that. Uh, tests have to be simple. It's like no one will write tests which are really difficult. If you can't really test uh, easily, then, then, then you're screwed. Tests should express what and not how. So if you have branches in your tests, that's bad because they should be, uh, you should express what you really want and not uh, how to get there. It, meaning that you would have to have tests for tests. So we don't want to do that. Uh, equality. That's really important, in my opinion. So you should treat the production code and test, test code exactly the same. There's no like, oh, I don't really care about the refactoring the tests because it's their tests. No, it's the same thing. And performance, testable code shouldn't affect the performance. So uh, it's like a lot of companies are doing interfaces or stuff like that just for the sake of testing. And I think that's not the way to go because you lose performance just because of uh, have been, been able to, to test. So in my opinion, that's part two. So, so I'll have a few advices here how to achieve those goals. So the first one is to consider using a testing framework, a good, even better testing, a good maybe is an even better idea. So what I mean by good, easy to add new tests, proper assertions, features, a lot of things you can think of. So. So what we have these days, uh, if you want to write uh, a testing without the framework, uh, we have assert, uh, we have uh, methods, functions, and that's basically it. Uh, so it's really difficult to write tests like that. But we have solutions for that already. We have boost test, we have catch, Phil is here, so uh, he'll probably like that solution as well. So I really advise you to use catch, uh, it's really good. Mm. We have other solutions, uh, one of those solutions is Google Test, which is quite popular. So uh, I will talk about here about, uh, about uh, GUnit, uh, which I wrote is like an extension for Google Test, because if you stack with the Google Test and Google Mock, uh, sometimes in the company, it's easier to extend it instead of changing it. So, so the idea is pretty much the same as in Catch. So you can use uh, strings instead of uh, labels, and you can write the should. Uh, and setup and teardown will be in the test instead of a base class. Also on the bottom, you can see the lightweight version of testing. Uh, it's not really standard because we don't have uh, the uh, you know, compile time strings yet, but uh, it makes testing much easier, in my opinion, because you don't have to use macros. So just to go about the GUnit stuff, so we have a test, we have the setup, which you can see this, there is no base class or anything like that. We just have uh, our dependencies here. We write the should, which is one test, and the other test is uh, the other should, and after that we have tear down. So the way it works, uh, we go from the top, we set up it once, we run the should clause, the second should clause won't be run, and after that have tear down, and again for the second test. So it makes testing much easier than having the base classes and and, and other things. So small things matter in the end because you, want, you don't want to pay for testing. You don't want to make it hard. It's much easier this way, in my opinion. So, so another thing is, uh, uh, which is important in my opinion, is to consider using a good mocking framework. And what I mean by good uh, is that, uh, well, macros are maybe not the best idea, in my opinion, to write uh, mocks because it's extremely hard and difficult to maintain. Uh, other things, you, 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 you should be able to support not only mocking interfaces, but also templates, concepts, or type erasure. And you should write, be able to write the mock just for all of them the same way, because you don't really care what is it. Uh, and obviously, uh, they have to be easier than the handwritten stabs or fakes. So if it comes to that, uh, there's a distinction between, between stabs, fakes, and uh, mocks. 
Uh, so fakes, usually you may use them in the like performance testing, so you don't want to pay for the overhead of mocking. Stabs, on the other hand, is a like precursor of mocks, where you have to put the simple behavior and uh, uh, you know verify it on your own. But mocks are the solution which which seems to be the best and the easiest to use. So in a sense, in an object in which you set an expectations and which are verified when the mocks is uh, deleted. So the story so far for mocking, we have Google Mock, for example, it's quite popular. Uh, I don't know whether you see the bug in the middle. Uh, it's quite hard to spot the bugs with Google Mock and it's quite tedious to maintain that. So, uh, so, so here, here, if you put mock cons method, it should be zero instead of one, but well, if you copied it, you won't spot it. So it's quite difficult, but, but you can deal with it and sometimes we will have to do that, we'll see. As well, as well. <laughs> yeah, therefore, therefore we don't want to use that. Fair point. So the other uh, uh, mock uh, in case of mock interfaces, there are modern alternatives. There's Mocado from uh, Peter, but it's tied to Eclipse, so it's maybe not the best solution. There's Pete's uh, Hippo mocks, there's Fake It, and there's, there are much more of solutions based, uh, based on B table and one of those is Google Mock as well. So it's basically like Hippo Mock or Fake It just with uh, interface to the Google Mock. So obviously I won't be talking about Hippo Mocks because we had the talk about that already. Uh, uh, so I'll just briefly talk about uh, Gmock. So we have an interface, I read there and we just want to mock it. The only thing we have to do is to put, to, you know, to put in Gmock and after that we can verify uh, uh, what we want and set the expectations. So the expect call is like, has everyone used Google Mock here? Yeah, most of you. So yeah, it's pretty much the same. You don't have to make my changes. Uh, how, well, we had a talk from, from Pete, so I'll skip that. If you want to really know how, how the Vtable magic works, uh, I will advise you to, to, watch, to watch it or just, you know, Go back in time or just watch it on YouTube, depending on. Slides are already online, so if you watch the bike right now, you can. All right, awesome. So, so what about templates? Because obviously, interfaces is not the whole word for us. We have templates, uh, and with templates, we are back to the square one because we have to use macros. There's no other option for us right now because we can't generate. Uh, anything out of the templates because it depends on the usage. So here we'll have to go back to macros. So maybe, maybe templates are not the best idea. But we, what we can do, we can use concepts. M maybe not concepts light because we don't have it them yet. Uh, we probably will have them in some form in 20, but we can emulate them in 14 or 17. So here, for example, readable, it might be the same as the interface. Uh, just with the concept, so you have it has to be copy constructible, copy assignable, and this weird thing call, uh, callable is just that the the read the, the template t has to be callable with a function which has name read, which returns an int, uh, and this will expose uh, uh, the the method for for the mocking and do other stuff. So so the concept itself will. Uh, will verify uh, the constraints, so it's still the same idea as the concepts. It just gives us uh, more flexibility. And this dollar is a macro. Sorry about that. You could write it by hand, uh, but you would have to do it a bit uh, more tedious. I'll show it in a sec. I just wanted to say that all these mocking fac uh, concepts facilities you can use for other things. So you can do it, uh, you can use it for constraint checking. So that's concept light main purpose. You will get nice error messages. You can use it for type erasure. So out of the concept, you can actually generate the type erasure thing, like uh, Louis was saying Dino. Actually, I'm using Dino under the hood. And you can do mocking as well. So you can mock uh, concepts, which is awesome. So we have one, one, one idea for all of those, which is based on the same concept. And I think that's really powerful. So how to test uh, uh, concepts? Well, concepts-based Gmog use looks exactly the same when we define this concept. We just say gmog readable, 
and we can use it the same exactly way as with interfaces. It doesn't really matter even with the type version, which we'll see in a sec. So how does it work? I won't be going into much details. That's the, the macro, uh, which we don't really want to write by hand, I guess. Uh, we, you have to do a bit of magic in order to, uh, to get uh, the name, because we can't reflect on the name yet. Maybe with the static reflection, we would be able to do that. So here on the line, Six, you have the constraint, which is for the verifying whether the constraint is satisfied for the concepts. And after that, you expose the name, which is the, the method, and you use a static polymorphism to dispatch it to the, to the call function, and call function will get the name, so you can, after that, dispatch it to whatever you want. Uh, I know it might be a bit difficult to get it now, but this talk is not really in, into that details. If you're really interested, just talk with me after. So what about type erasure? Type erasure, uh, in my opinion, is much better than the you know, interfaces because uh, we don't have to go for the heap. We don't have to use, we can use value semantics. Uh, and everything is hidden. We can use small buffer optimization. So it's much easier for us to deal with in C++. And there is like boost type erasure and other solutions already. However, none of those solutions is really tied to mocking and like you, you, you can't expose everything uh, at once. So that's the way the GUnit comes with and uh, PC with, which, which tries to tie all, all of that together. So in that case, when we have n, we can say readable, which is a concept. Uh, and you can just put the file reader or any other reader, which you can just change. So how would the, uh, the test look like? Well, I don't know whether you see the resemblance, but it's exactly the same as for concepts. Uh, so what does it mean? What does it mean is that when we have a test which is using uh, concepts or the ty type erase types, we don't have to change the test. Uh, the test. So if we started from the concept and after that, oh, we have to know this value, this type at runtime, we can just switch it and our test will still pass. And that's what I'm saying by testing has to be easy, not hard, because no one likes unit tests, which are breaking all the times. And you know, I have to fix the mog, I have to fix the uh, constructor, I have to fix that, that, and that. And in the end, I'll just remove it because uh, I don't see the value. That's usually an argument. So how is that done? Uh, well, under the hood is using Dyna from Louis. So, so it's basically the same concept as with the concepts uh, we just expose. Uh, uh, we just expose the concept map uh, for the user and we have this call method which has the name and we can dispatch it to the proper poly out of that. So, so about mocking. So there are a lot of features which uh, GUnit has which uh, G, uh, Google Mock doesn't have. So we don't have to write them. We support concepts, type erasure and interfaces. So that's pretty cool. I don't know whether you ever stumble upon like 10 parameters if you have a legacy interface or unique pointers. It doesn't, so it's not supported there. Overloaded operators, we can't deal with that easily. Uh, classes without, with constructors, it's maybe not a good advice to mock that, but uh, sometimes you need to. And it's obviously compatible with Google Mock, so we can use the, them together. So the other thing, uh, so that, that's the basic about uh, you know, frameworks and mocking. Uh, I think it's really straightforward and we can focus on things which are more important in my opinion. So I would really consider you know, as a good advice to write solid instead of the stupid code. Stupid in, well, in quotes. Uh, I hope no one will get offended by that. Uh, what I mean by stupid is singleton, tight coupling, untestability, premature optimizations, bad naming and duplications. Uh, I think everyone has seen some of those or maybe all of those. Uh, I hope you don't have too much uh, in your code of those, uh, but you know, we all have the code we have. Uh, what, uh, what about things which would, from the solid principles, from the Uncle Bob would help us a lot with, with testing? is mainly the single responsibility because we can test in isolation small things and dependency inversion, uh, which will uh, let us to, uh, to, uh, to depend on the abstractions, not really on the concrete implementations. 
So, so let's think about one fe a feature and maybe implement it. So you know the rule, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, I would say here it might be just, just stupid, not really keep it simple, because how to test this code? Any ideas? How to test, unit test it? Integration test it? I don't know. Maybe you, you can you know, write a bash script or something, I don't know. Uh, it's extremely difficult to, mm, to, uh, to, to test it. Uh, I, I just give up. So that's not, that's not a good idea. So as a good dev, uh, we iterate on that. Maybe we started from that if we didn't do the TDD, let's say. Uh, so yeah, after, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of code, we read a lot of code, and we wrote that. So we have some classes because it's kind of like C+, let's say. Uh, we have our manager. So that's the name in immediately, a god object, which is print value, read value, update, reset, and tons of those. After that, we'll have a you know, constructor with the manager, uh, which we tightly couple ourselves, so there's no way to test it. It obviously has to be always in line because that's the way to be the fastest. Uh, we will have logger, which will be a singleton, because there's no other way to do the logger. We'll repeat ourselves with the manager read value. Uh, so there you have it. It's, it's, it's the code which we don't want to write because it's untestable. I hope you agree with me on that one. So, so what we can do? Uh, well, what we can do about that? Well, th this code is a bit better than the previous one because we can write some integration tests, but it's still extremely <coughs> di difficult to, to do it. We can go about with like, I don't know, define private public or any other ideas, uh, but I wouldn't go that, that way. So we, so we took some solid courses because we want to you know, develop ourselves and we learn about single responsibility. Everyone knows about that? I hope you, you know. So uh, a class should have only one reason to change, uh, not more. So it's a perfect example of, uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this knife or whatever it is. It's hard to even give you the name uh, well, because it's doing so many things. So, so after that, what we'll do? Well, we, we extract our reader and printer because it seems like it makes sense. Uh, we have something which reads, which has something which prints. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's do it. So we have our single responsibility. Uh, we put reader, we put printer and, and logger. We, they shouldn't be references, sorry about that. Uh, and, and what do we do? How, how do we test that? Uh, that's one question. The other question, the other thing is, I don't know whether you know about the law of the matter. So you should only talk to your immediate friends, which means that you never should, uh, should have get, get, like get manager, get printer, get uh, reader and print, something like that, because the, this code is really hard to test because you have so many chain of commands. So, so although we use the single responsibility principle, I still don't know how to test it. Uh, it's, uh, we're still tightly coupled to everything, to reader, printer, and, and logger. Uh, so it helped us a bit, because we can test reader and printer, but our app, uh, it's still hard to test. So, so what we've done, we, we took some more solid courses, uh, and we learned about dependency inversion principle. So there are a lot of rules above that, but the main idea is that you should not depend on the concrete classes, but you should depend on the abstractions. So this way, uh, it's actually a natural way, because if you see the picture, it's like you would never like, you know, soldier a lamp directly, yeah, would you? So why we write code like that, on the other hand? I don't know. So for the purpose of the first solution, we'll put it into interfaces because that's the way usually we go. Because, you know, also the manager would like maybe have different readers and printers because, uh, because that's what uh, requirement says. So obviously we'll put an interface on it. And we'll use here dependency injection. So inversion is just depending on abstractions and injection means that I will inject those, so we don't collapse, we'll call you, that's the Hollywood principle, so we inject dependencies instead of 
uh, building them ourselves. So whenever you see a new or make unique in the code, it means that you violate that rule and you probably will have a lot of struggle with testing. So what about testing that guy? Well, we can do easily mocking here. So I just wanted to point out the difference between nice, strict, uh, and waggy mock, which is by default. So by default, Gmock uh, and Google mock will print the warning. I think it's the worst default ever because uh, who, who checks the logs in the test? You just want to see a green or red. But oh well, so by default, you should use trig mock, which means that it will fail, or nice mock if you really don't care about something. I, can, I don't see much reasons to use nice mocks, but maybe logger, I don't know. But anyway, the testing of that guy is much easier. We mock everything, we create an app, we inject everything which we uh, care, cared about. Uh, and then we just test it. We set our expectations, we call run, and read should be, uh, should be called, should return 42, and after that print, should, should print it. Straightforward. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so sorry about that. So that works, but it's kind of Java style because we have interfaces and it's not really C++, modern C++, or let's say postmodern C++ these days. <laughs> so we have heap, we have reference and point, or pointer semantics, we have inheritance, and we know that inheritance is the base class of evil. Uh, we have... That's yet another dogma. Pardon? That's yet another dogma. Yeah. So, we have dynamic dispatch and performance. Well, we may have uh, indirection call, indirect call, although with the final keyword, we may get rid of it in some cases, but with the devirtualization, but most likely we won't in all cases, so we'll still pay for it. So as a C++ developer, we don't, don't want to do Java, we want to do C++, and what does it mean? <laughs> that, <laughs> that we'll use templates and concepts, so. I hope there's no Java that books here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, you know, they have to deal with their own stuff. So, so what about concepts? So as I said before, we can write the concepts for that. Uh, we can't write concepts light, so the light we just commented on the second uh, code uh, would be a concept light, unless this short notation would be removed, I don't know. So, so for now, let's stick with like injecting the templates and we'll just static assert whether they are uh, readable, printable, loggable, and stuff like that. We will still uh, stick with the, uh, with the injection. And what about testing? Well, the only thing which we tested, changed here, is the fact that ilog ilogger is called loggable, and readable is uh, instead of I iReader. That's all, it's just the name. From my perspective, the test is exactly the same. So, so I think that's handy. Yeah. But that's on, concepts are only useful at compile time. Yeah, if you don't know them at compile time, well, we can't do much. So, so what about the runtime? So, as I said, runtime, uh, as I said before, runtime is for type erasure. So let's do it with uh, without uh, inheritance. We'll, let's use the type erasure. So instead of passing the templates, let's uh, let's pass any uh, in the constructor. So the, I don't know whether you know, there's a proposal for, there was proposal, I don't know whether it was rejected yet or not, for the virtual concepts, which kind of uh, would achieve the concepts, uh, uh, virtual uh, type erasure with concepts, uh, uh, but we don't have it. So, so the way uh, we can do it for now is by having a library, for example, any, we can use boost type erasure or anything else, uh, it's just, I'm using any because this way I can easily test it, so. So what about the test? Well, as I said before, the test is exactly the same as, uh, as with concepts. So there's no difference here. So whether we change the, uh, the app to take something at runtime or something at compile time, it doesn't really matter for us. So, so from testing perspective, that's really good because we don't really have to care about changing the test and changing constructors and tests when we change something which shouldn't really affect that. 
But there's one thing which uh, Solid introduced here, and, 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 and all of that is the wiring. So we kind of move the problem from, from the, within the class, outside the class, and that's the way we solved it. But we didn't really solve it because we introduced, we just called the wiring mass. So all these, the test before that, they didn't have all these, you know, boilerplate, which you have to write, like nice, GMO, logger, reader, printer. Or in the production, we would have to create every frame, uh, like wiring, and just wire everything together. And it's like, this example is really simple, but when you have really extreme classes, then it's uh, much, much harder to maintain that. So, so in a sense, Solid produces a testable code and better design, but because of the single responsibility principle, we have a lot of classes because all of them will have single responsibility. And all of that will introduce the wiring mess because we'll have to create all of those objects and pass them, which makes that a bit hard to maintain because we'll have to change whenever we change a constructor of something. And programmers are lazy by default. So what we do instead, we will break kind of the single responsibility because it would be easier for us to extend the type instead of, you know, I'll do any other hack. And then we'll just, you know, uh, get into the vicious, vicious circle without single responsibility. So, so I think we have to solve that problem too uh, in order to make that, you know, testing easy. And how can we do that? So, uh, I'm not a huge fan of factories, you can solve it by factories. I think factories are extremely hard to test and extremely hard to maintain as well, especially static factories. I think static factories are just terrible and should never be used in any code uh, because there's no way to test them and they just basically hide the problem uh, and not solve it. But the proper solution, in my opinion, would be the dependency injection kind of framework, which will you know, create all these variables for us and just inject everything which we need appropriately. So that's another thing which I think we should consider. Uh, we should consider using dependency edition framework to avoid the wiring mess and to inject smogs automatically. So, uh, so the goal of uh, that is not to be forced to maintain a lot of boilerplate just in order to be able to test. And I think that's the problem which we have these days. So, so I presented uh, this library last year, so let me just uh, give you an overview if you haven't seen it. So BoostDI is a dependency injection framework. It's not really in Boost uh, for the bracket. Uh, and the way it works, it can deduce the constructor parameters for us. It doesn't need a, a macro or anything like that. It's just a template magic. It will deduce the scope, so for example, uh, the reference, which means that the, uh, if you have another uh, object which will take the reference, it will be the same object. If you pass by a unique pointer or by value, it will be different. Uh, if you have a share pointer, you probably want the same one. You can put it explicitly as well. But from usage perspective, on the bottom you can see uh, that when you want to create an app, you just say make, you just say make app. And, and that's all. And reader and printer will be created and will be injected into, uh, into the app. So this guy is a bit more complex because obviously we want to do more, more magical stuff in order to, to achieve the, you know, uh, achieve that testing won't affect the performance. So if you want to have testable code which won't uh, you know uh, do the like trigger the performance degradation? We have to kind of get rid of interfaces and stuff like that. So we'll have to use templates or concepts. Uh, and with DI, we can actually do that. So we can inject concepts or templates. So on the first line, you have like a reader, and it take and the default is readable. And if it's readable, we can wire to file reader, and the way it works, it will uh, check the app, all the things which are, or the types which are required for it. It will uh, bind the appropriate type, and after that, it will deduce the constructor appropriately to what we injected up front. So it's just kind of two, two phase resolving. Uh, and the wiring, so concepts are 
st uh, a check statically before even creating a make. So on, when we create the injector, we can immediately check whether the reader, the file reader is readable or not. So you will get one line message that, or many lines, depends on how many information we want, whether, the, whether we, we can bind it or not. So that's extremely useful because a lot of uh, you know, problems we have with concepts is that uh, we'll still get the full call stack. We can also inject, a, like, I call it like weak kind of generic concept, like auto. So the class size is just a name. So we can inject that as well. So we say, oh, class size should be, I don't know, 42 or something like that. Uh, we can also put a config if you want. It will be just passed. And all these like unique pointers, references, all of that we don't have to really care about unless we want to. But by default, uh, it will be injected appropriately to what we have uh, in the constructor. So it, it seems like natural that unique pointer will give us a unique value, for example. Yeah? And by value, it will give us uh, a unique value too. And reference, it should be the same for, for a few. Uh, object. But you know, you can ask how that help us at all with the wiring mess. So, so let me give you an example. So, so for the manual DI, first we have this app which takes two constructed parameters. We create them, we do this boilerplate wiring, after that we, we create it and run it. With DI, it's basically we create an app and we run it. And also, I wanted to point out that with both DI you can gain quite a bit of the performance because you know everything at compile time, so you know all the objects you're creating. So you can do cache friendly layout of those. You can do everything you want. You can just inject the policy of how to, how to deal with everything you know. So you can you know, allocate a buffer up front or whatever, but you, you don't have to you know, know the size. You will exactly know the size, how many objects will be allocated and how, how much size they will take. So that's handy. But you know, moving back to the testing itself. So if you change the constructor here uh, from reader and printer being references to printer being the first parameter and the reader will be a unique uh, parameter as the second one. With manual DI, we have to change everything, yeah? Because all the wiring changed, so. And, and one more thing which is really important is that the fact that the order of creating the uh, the dependencies is important. So sometimes if you change the order of dependencies in a constructor, you'll have to change everything in the, in the main as well. So you may mess up doing that for, for quite a bit of time. And obviously no one likes doing that and everyone prefer to debug stuff instead, I guess. Yeah, that's the uh, question. Yeah, so, so, so the question is uh, whether, whether the DI framework uh, handles uh, dependencies where the app, the printer would depend on something else in the constructor afterwards. So, so the whole object graph is created out of the DI. So, so if the console printer depends on any other templates or in constructor any other parameters, they will be resolved as well and, and so forth up, up, to, up to the end, I guess. Uh, so, so with DI, well, there's no changes. It's like, it's the same code because we didn't have to bind anything. So we don't have any interfaces or concepts. So everything is tightly coupled, which is not testable code, but to prove the point, with DI, we, we can get the object graph created for us automatically without thinking of it. So that's really handy for integration tests especially. So when we have, for example, in the production, a code like that, so we now have our injector when we bind some concepts to, to, some, to some concrete implementations. We may have database, for example, or logger or something like that, which we don't really want to test in our integration test because, well, it might be difficult. So integration tests are plumbing tests, so we want to change the configuration. It's not an acceptance test, so we may want to fake that guy. But we don't want to fake other guys because other guys are good for us. So from integration test perspective, you can just override a database to fake database to, mo to a mock. So, uh, so in that case, all the readable, printable 
stuff, uh, objects will be will be the same as in the production, and the uh, database will be just overridden. So this way we can easily uh, test in uh, integration. But we can do more. In my opinion, we can do more, especially for the isolation, the unit testing, because well, I find it extremely boring and boilerplate to write a GMOC reader, printer, a logger, or whatever we change or add. Because with those guys, when you change it to unique pointer or shared pointer, you would have to change it as well. Uh, you can do it uh, if you have a base class once or something like that, but you will have to still do it. And I think we don't have to do that. Uh, I think we can uh, do, do something which will do it for us because you know testing has to be easy, and we don't want to. Really, I don't want you know be. Uh, I can't be asked doing that, in my opinion. So we can have uh, you know use DI and mocking, which I introduced before. So let's let's use the boost DI and gmock uh, just in order to create everything for us. So we will just put testing make and up, and we'll get here the structure binding. So we'll get. Uh, like a pair of app, which will be created in app, and mocks. And mocks will contain all the mocks, whether they were a concept or type erasure or interfaces, doesn't really matter. We'll get all of those into the mocks. And after that, we can verify whether the readable or printable uh, mock was called appropriately and we when we run the app. So that's extremely handy for us if it comes to testing. So to to prove my point, when we change a bit of test, uh, so when we change the constructor or anything like that, uh, in the first example with the manual, with the manual uh, DI, we would have to change basically everything. We'll have to do even a bit of hacks for supporting the unique pointers to keep the pointer when we move it. Uh, so all, all of that is quite hard, and also please notice that the expert call will change as well. We'll have to dereference the reader because it was a shared pointer. Uh, so all of that is just tedious. No one likes that. And with DI and uh, with the automatic mox injection, well, it's same old. It's exactly the same it was, uh, although it should be printable on the bottom. Uh, but uh, besides that, it's exactly the same. So we don't have to care about changing uh, our tests and, and in the production code as well when we have the wiring when we use that. So if we compare the changes, uh, line of code uh, changed five out of six, well not that good, and we added one more line and here we just didn't change anything. So as I said, testing has to be easy and in my, in my opinion with this approach is, unit testing is m much easier this way. So how is that done? Uh, well, it's based on DI. I, maybe I won't be going into the details, but it's basically uh, using the, exp the implicit conversion operator and a bit of kind of concepts approach. So when you have a polymorphic type, let's say, just for the interfaces here. Uh, so if you want to fake automatically the interfaces, uh, you go, so, so this mocker, uh, it's passed to the T, Let's say we deduce how many parameters are in the constructor. We can do that and with a bit of template magic. And after that, we create mocker with the args and mocks because args are in case if it's, if it's, if it's not the polymorphic type. But if it is, uh, then we just add to the mocks instead of uh, you know, getting from the args. So this way, we can easily, easily create mocks when we have interfaces. And the other case is when we have concepts or templates uh, or type erasure. And in other, any other case, we'll just pass what was passed to us. So you can pass additional arguments if you, if you, if you really want uh, to the uh, constructor of the, of the app. Yeah, I know that might be a bit blurry, but uh, I don't think I have really time to explain that. So grab me after if, you, if you're interested in that. But you know, you can think on the other hand that if you have, uh, you know, a lot of parameters, and uh, and you use automatic mox injection, then it actually may hide the problem on its own because if you have 20 of, of parameters into your constructor, and after that, uh, you'll see the test, uh, you won't see in the test immediately that oh, it's too long. You will see maybe in expect calls, which 
is an indication already that oh, that's something that's going on. But in a sense, it will kind of hide, uh, hide the bad design. So in order to fix that, uh, I think it's important and the actually main, uh, main moral of this talk is to use test-driven development approach. So what does it mean? It means that we should write tests before the implementation. So who is, who is doing that on daily basis? Yeah, there's a few hands, so that's good. Uh, so you have two approaches here. Well, we have much more, but two main approaches. When we have test-driven development, when we write unit testing, unit tests, and behavior-driven development, when we we can do it in unit tests, but usually we write integration or acceptance tests because we focus on the behavior more than the fun functions. So the mantra of uh, TDD is red green refactor. So we always start from the uh, test, which will be read by default because we don't have an implementation. Uh, and the compilation fail is also the right phase. We make it pass, but we make it pass in a specific way, which is the simplest way possible. We don't, you know, this way we don't over engineering and try to solve all world problems at once. We'll always implement what we need. And after that, we refactor. So maybe after first test, we won't have a lot of duplicates. But after second test, we probably will have duplicates in the test or code or bad naming or anything because we try to make it pass as, as simple as possible. And then we just refactor those guys. So Uncle Bob defines three rules of TDD. If you are not familiar with those, you should print them and put them on your desk. Uh, so you are not allowed to write any production count unless it's making a, a unless it is uh, to make a failing uh, unit test pass, which meaning that you don't write code before the implementation, uh, you don't write implementation before the test, and you are not uh, to write any more of unit test than is sufficient to fail. Uh, so, as I said, you don't write more code than you need, you write only the code which is required for the test to pass. Uh, and compilation failures are failures as well. So if you have the test which is not compiling, the first step is to make it to compile and fail. And we are not allowed to write any more production code that is sufficient to pass the filing unit test, as I said in a second ago. So to sum up the TDD, I think it's really important to understand the benefits of, of it. So the first, we only implement what we actually need. So there is no over-engineering, no frameworks out of the box because I fancy those. You just do whatever it takes to, 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 you know, to deliver what you need. So that's really good from a deliverable perspective because you, know, you won't spend two weeks trying to implement something just because you know, your test was failing. It implies 100% coverage because everything is tested out of the box. So you don't need coverage in a sense. We always know that our code works. So we can easily refactor everything because we, we are covered. And it's not like I'm scared to touch this part of the code because I don't have tests and I don't know what to do with those. And extremely important thing is the documentation. So it's runnable documentation which is always up to date. It's not like, I don't know, Doxygen or something like that where, where it might be not up to date. It's always up to date because it has to compile and it has to pass. So you know uh, this way that you can check it out, how to use uh, a class, what's the purpose of it, and you know, it, it shows you everything. You don't have to deal with the documentation because unit has already a documentation on its own. And, and it's loosely coupled code uh, as well. We'll never produce singletons with TDD because that's not possible to test. We'll never do that. So if you see singletons, God objects, or globals or anything like that, it means that it wasn't written in TDD. And you can be sure of that, unless someone didn't know how to do TDD properly. And we had talked about uh, this uh, JSON thing, uh, and the implementing JSON to compile time with Consexpr. Uh, so th the solution was to do like, you know, debugging, it was hard. So the solution was to implement, like to add the consp expr, expr trace or something like that. Well, with TDD, we don't need that because we know that we implement the simple, uh, we write a bit of code and we implement the simplest way uh, uh, to make it pass. So this way we always know, we don't have to copy like 
bunch of code and tries to figure it out. That's not always true. In case of the uh, contextual uh, implementation, the problem was that unlike what you normally get with test-driven development is that you run your test cases and you find that one or two are failing, you basically just get a compiler that says something somewhere is wrong. Which is like your test case is saying, well, something failed, but not saying anything more. So figuring out what's wrong is the biggest problem and this wouldn't help. Okay, so the question is that with const, the problem with the const expression was a bit different, that you couldn't figure out what was actually failing. But I would argue that if you have a small test, a lot of those, uh, so, and they would be descriptive enough that you would actually understand what is going on. Up to the point that you start refactoring. Up to the point you would start refactoring. Uh, when you start refactoring, you start changing your code around, and you're typically notified by which unit tests are failing, what kind of problem you made. Yeah. In and this case, at that point, you would stop compiling for everything. It would stop you compiling, yeah. You broke and how you fix it. Yeah, that, that's fair point. It would stop uh, uh, compiling, so you, you would have to fix it this way. Yeah. You can still follow TD, though. Yeah? You would still get benefits. Maybe not. It's not perfect. I'm not saying that, you know, cons expression will be fixed by TDD. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's easier to deal with problems. Yeah. So what's the difference between uh, BDD and TDD? Because it's like... A, a difference which is, uh, you know, not really uh, with the approach, but rather with the naming and, you know, kind of the, the way you, of your mindset. So, for example, with TDD, we say expect call and expect, but with BDD, we would like to have something which is more readable from the business kind of perspective. So, we say given, then, so you, you've probably heard of given, when, then uh, approach, uh, and notice, for example, when, when on TDD, you would say expect count equal, equals 4. With BDD, we would say then count should be 4. It's a small difference, but it's, uh, it's about reading the, reading the test, so it will be easier for you to follow it. So that's the main thing. And the other thing is this, that if it comes to language, and the other thing which is different is the, is the scope. With TDD, we lock the implementation because we change the functions. If you change anything in the, in the class, we'll have to change the test. With BDD, well, we lock the behavior, so we don't, won't have to change it, uh, because the behavior is kind of more abstract thing. So BDD is really useful, and uh, for, especially for acceptance testing, in my opinion. So has anyone used or seen Cucumber before? Yeah, not all of you. So Cucumber is like, a language, in like text language, in which you specify the BDD style acceptance tests, let's say, with the given when then uh, approach. So you say, for example, scenario one, value from a file is displayed, given I have something, blah, blah, when then. So, so that's where you specify it. But the best thing out of the cucumber is the fact that you can actually glue it together with some uh, some macros and some uh, some code, uh, which kind of matches the the thing which you write into which you wrote into into the scenario. And when you do that, you can actually run the tests. So, from the you know acceptance driven test perspective, that's really cool because you can specify the acceptance criteria on your retro like refinement, and after that you can go and do the TDD and go back when you finally done to just do the glue for the for the cucumber and the test will pass or not depending on uh, how well you've done your testing before but in my opinion it's really valuable to have tests like that because then you have acceptance criteria by default uh, which are runnable which is awesome so to sum up the bdd it's complementary with tdd so the approach is pretty much the same. We write the tests before the implementation, but the focus is a bit different. So we focus on the customer needs, behaviors, instead of the functions themselves. I think the, the main uh, value is when we combine them together. But, but that's what we'll try to do next. So, so you know, I, I've been talking about uh, uh, CDD, BDD, mocking frameworks, and stuff like that, but we didn't have any, you know, uh, 
proper example how to do that. So in order to, to showcase it, uh, let's implement the trading system. Because why not? Obviously, I wouldn't advise you to take it into the market because you will just lose everything. <laughs> but, but, but that's the approach I want to show and uh, share with you. So what we'll use? We'll use kind of model, uh, modern stuff. So we'll try to do, the, uh, to do it with Agile and Scrum. We'll do the modeling with the UML. Uh, the design will be concept driven uh, because as I said before, performance matters. Uh, and development, we'll do BDD, TDD, and extreme programming techniques, just in order to make it as easy for us uh, as possible. And obviously, we'll do continuous integration in order to deliver it as soon as. So how do we start? We have the product backlog refinement with our product owner and all these business people. And you know, they prioritize some stories. And they say, oh, Chris, give me an automated training system. Next sprint, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's for tomorrow, for yesterday. Uh, so, so we'll get that of the refinement, and we'll do in the refinement as well. We'll define the acceptance criteria for for the trading system. So, how we'll do it? Well, I think the best idea is to do it with the cucumber and this given when then BDD approach, because this way, kind of we move the responsibility for writing those not only for developers, but also for the business people and the you know, clients and our like managers, because this way they'll feel more responsible to, to make it right and, and developers may easily you know, make them pass uh, afterwards and you know, say, well, you, you, they, they can say to the boss that, well, the, the axiomas criteria weren't good enough, so we can iterate after a few iteration later on and define them better. But, uh, this way, it's much easier to understand what's going on. And uh, the developers are not you know, blind trying to implement something which they don't understand. It's really important that everyone will get all the stories and everything, the product refinements, so that they can easily estimate when they're planning. So for example, here we'll have like scenario one. Uh, so trading system request to buy shares. We say when the trading system, the given the trading system is up and running, so when Google stock is rising, for example, for the last 1,000 transactions, uh, we're smart enough to think that maybe Apple, uh, buying Apple might be a good idea because it will go up. Who knows? Uh, as I said, don't quote me on the strategies. I have no idea how that works. So you wouldn't make much money. So as I said, if we use the cucumber here, we already have our acceptance test and our acceptance criteria. So we don't even have to do acceptance test-driven development because we already have the test. We just don't have the glue, but the glue might be introduced by the TDD when we introduce all the classes and all the collaborations and everything like that. And after that, we'll just write the glue for, write the for, for our acceptance test because we'll go for, from one acceptance test and we always do the cross-function as I will show in a sec. So maybe I will just go further. And maybe important things, like accordingly to the Uncle Bob, acceptance tests are written by the business, for the business. So they are not written by, by developers. Having that in mind, maybe it's important. So in my opinion, it's always good to have a bit of design, uh, just to, you know, to have a bit of vision. Because if you don't have vision, you don't know where to put stuff. It doesn't mean that has to be a, it's like, for example, I like to have design where you have loosely coupled components, uh, kind of a vision, domain, it's not classes or anything like that. But when we think about trading system, we can think about maybe, I don't know, market data, some exchange, some feeds, some strategies, some engines, something like that. Uh, it's a really loosely coupled idea. And it, it doesn't mean that we'll put them uh, this way into the production. It means that when we think about the trading system, we'll think about something like that. So that it will be easier to see the vision of I think I should have a handler, so I'll put, you know, market data related stuff into the handler, and handler should, you know, depends on the feeds or something like that. And the strategy obviously shouldn't be in the handler because you can easily distinguish that up front. So the, na the next part of the design and the workshop would be to, you know, to write the activities. Uh, so 
So the main one will be, look, you connect to the market data, you process some feeds. If we have feeds, we go and, uh, and uh, whether we check whether we are subscribed, whether they're rising or not. If they are, we execute some orders. If we're not, we don't. Idea like that. Uh, so this way we can easily, uh, you know, think about the trading system this way. And after that, we can, you know, for the planning, we can, we can make our stories. Our stories always should be cross-functional, in my opinion, because otherwise we can't easily deliver. So we can take one acceptance test-driven uh, BDD uh, acceptance test and make it happen. So the easiest one, we should start maybe from the easiest one because they are the easiest to deliver. So in this case, we can just deliver for the like version 01, connect, process feeds, but there's no feeds, so we disconnect. And that's what we try, we'll try to implement. Uh, also, we don't have to connect to the exchange because we don't have exchange, so we just connect to the market data. So this way, uh, we'll have a lot of stories like that, which will go from the top to the bottom, and always they'll be deliverable, all the time. So we don't really have to think about you know, what we else have to do in order to implement. And after that, our commit will have all the cross-functional stuff, so we can easily remove it or build on top of it. So what kind of stories we'll get here? They will be in priority order, obviously. So first one will be parse feeds, let's say. It always is deliverable, so I wanted to point it out here. So we connect to the market data, we process feeds, there are no feeds, we disconnect. Simple story, but we can immediately deliver it and get the you know, early feedback and see what's going on. Whether maybe the, our solution already was bad. Maybe we shouldn't connect to the market data or maybe we shouldn't process the feeds. Maybe that's not suitable for us. And after that, we'll go to the like, handle buy, handle sell and, and others, which will be required for the trading system. So, so we have planning. On the planning, we don't obviously design and work from and think, oh, what we have to implement for that guy? Because that's way too late. Planning is a short session when we just put the estimates and, and just uh, commit to stuff. Uh, so it's important for, to have the like story points kind of uh, thing so that uh, it's a number which, which tells the team how hard the story is. It's obviously relevant, so we have to have something which will tell us what the one story point is. So for example, one story point might be, I don't know, handle a message or something like that, depending on, on, uh, depending on your application. But knowing that, we can obviously iterate after a few uh, iterations with the team. We'll put some story points on those. We'll have some velocity, which means that we'll have the velocity, uh, how many points we can actually commit for in the sprint on average. So in, in that case, let's say I estimated as a team, uh, parse feeds as a free story point, handled by eight story points, because I think it's like three times more complex than parse feeds, and handle sell as two story points, because when I have handled by, it won't be that complex. And I do, as a team, we do 12 story points. So I can commit for the first two because I can't really take the third one. So yeah, sprint started and let's do it. So we'll take the parse feeds as a first story will be uh, in progress. So I think it's like one more, which will focus on TDD here. So I think it's very important to, to say how TDD is good with the extreme programming, which for example is pairing. I think it's really valuable for everyone if you pair that you always should pair because when you write your code on your own, it's never good. Uh, it will be, even if you do, do code review, it will never, you'll never get to the solution as quickly as the knowledge sharing, it will be quite, uh, quite slow. So in my opinion, it's much easier to get into the solution when you pair, but you should pair in a specific way in TDD. So at first, one developer should write the test and the other you immediately should think uh, how to make it pass this way. So that this way, when you pair, both parties are involved. Because otherwise, when you just look you know, uh, behind the shoulder, what the other person is doing, well, you won't be involved, you won't know. You won't be able to do next day, you, you won't be able to start the next day uh, on your own. It will be just too hard. So, so this way, you write the test, the other person is making it pass, and you switch the roles so that all the time you are involved and all the time uh, good things are happening. 
So let's do the TDD. So in, in, in C++, usually we should start from expectations uh, because we don't have all these magic tools like in Java when all of that will be happening for us automatically with IDE. Uh, so let's write a bit of test. Should connect and the test should be, you know, reasonable named so they express what should happen. So the test may, may, may say should connect to the market data on startup. We use our facilities here, uh, which I introduced before, because uh, I don't really, uh, I can't be us just doing it the other way. And how, how do we test? So we test that the market data uh, should connect on the startup. And that's all our test. How to make it pass? Well, right now it didn't compile. So, so from our perspective, we'll use the mock, uh, the concept, so that it will be easier for us to not to pay for the performance because a lot of people think that TDD may actually cause the performance degradation, and it may uh, if you don't think you know if you don't have a vision or anything like that. But usually you have kind of vision, and if you don't use interfaces by default, you won't pay for anything. So that will be uh, the the way to go. So when we have the market data, which is a concept here, as I said before, callable, connect. Uh, and the simplest way here, we don't really care about it being struct, it being not having a constructor or whatever. We just make it pass. And that's the easiest way to make it pass because we have to have a mock. So, so you could do it differently. You can just inject a template and write the Google mock on your own. But this way we can get the, uh, the mocked, uh, mock out of the gmock. So, and we can you know, automatically inject all the mocks. So that would be the easiest way in my opinion. So our test passed. We go for the another one. Should not disconnect on stop if it wasn't connected. Uh, test is uh, as simple as the other one. We call the stop and we expect that the market data won't disconnect. And we make it pass. So we extend our market data interface for the another method. So one important thing with the concepts which I didn't mention before, is that you can actually have an optional interfaces which allows you to have a introspection by design, like Andre Alexandrescu likes to call it, which means that not all methods are required for the interface, which is a totally different concept than with interfaces where everything is required to, to belong and you have to implement everything. Here you can have optional, you can say or here, and that will still work in that case, but you know, uh, just to keep things rolling, uh, let's go back to the test. So the simplest implementation here and empty method just to fulfill the interface. So all the all the test passes, are we happy? Uh, and then the most important part of the TDD is to refactor because if you forget about this part, you may forget about TDD as well because you won't get the good design out of it because TDD is also about the design and des a testable design which will give you uh, a good code. And if you forget about the refactor, well, you will have a lot of duplicates, a lot of bad code and that won't be good. So we can immediately see uh, that we have a duplication uh, be, between tests, so we, we, we were creating the uh, uh, mocks and application twice in both tests separately. Well, let's extract that into one test with the shoot clauses. So that's one way to go about it. We can do it different ways, but I think that's, that's quite easy to do. So this way, uh, both tests are easily, easily to follow and, you know, you can see them immediately, what's going on. So this, this way we refactor the test because that's important as well. So when we say TD refactor, we don't say only TD refactor the code. We say TD refactor code and test. But in that case, we, we don't have to refactor uh, the code yet. Uh, let's, uh, let's say uh, we go to the, another role so the other person is you know, driving right now. We write another test. Should this connect on stop if it was connected? So we'll have this in sequence, which means that uh, they have to be in the calls have to be in sequence. And we do start and stop. And we expect the test to fail. 
So we make it pass. Uh, so the easiest way would be to make it pass this way. Uh, let's say we we'll introduce a boolean value and a branch. And then we refactor. Uh, we should do some refactor in the previous uh, case as well, if it comes to the test, but I just uh, did it this way uh, to show that we have to focus on the refactor in the test as well. Uh, so when we refactor the code, obviously we want to make it nicer. Uh, uh, and the way to do it is, for example, to have like encapsulation and other uh, solid techniques in order to make it happen. So that's quite, you know, trivial refactor to do. We can also do moder other things. So we can, with the refactor, it means that we can extract uh, uh, things into separate files. Because when we, ma when we were making it to pass, we didn't have to introduce a new file. So we could actually write all the implementation in the test just to make it pass. And after that, refactor it into separate files. So that's the uh, approach of TDD, make it pass, and after that, make it, make it good. So this way, I refactor the market data into another file, for example. So we'll go like that for a while. And when all tasks for the story are implemented, which means that all tests are passing, then we are ready to commit. So maybe we have done a lot of small commits in between. We should rebase them, in a sense. And and create the message which has value for other uh, users of, uh, of our application or for other devs. So, so that will have a new, uh, new message which we'll says that parse feeds, ability to parse feeds from market data will describe what, we, what was the problem and what was the solution. So this way, others can you know, easily follow what's going on. And the content, which is extremely important, uh, will have all the tests, cross-functional tests, like the TDD test, the integration test, the unit test, and the implementation for, for the deliverable only. So this way, when someone will log into the, into the commit, they will see the proper commit message, and they will see uh, what we actually implemented there, what we were trying to do. So then we'll do the code review, uh, because we, you know, we create a merge request because we don't push ourselves, obviously. And uh, one important thing is like when you do the code review, it's, it's like developers are easily offended. So it's never good to say, you stupid, you shouldn't use the magic numbers. You won't get the effect you want out of that. Uh, I think it's much better to say, did you consider using something else instead? Uh, although we know maybe that was stupid, but this way, <laughs> <laughs> but this way, uh, you know, developers won't be offended and they more likely to fix it because that's what we actually want. It's like if they think, oh, that was a good idea, I will fix it, and they'll think, that's my idea, cool, I'm, I'm awesome, <laughs> then it's even better. Um, is yes, and it was not a good idea, is that an acceptable answer? Or yes, if I they replied... I rejected it. Okay, so, so the, que the question was whether if they reply, well, it wasn't a good idea, what we should do? Well, <laughs> well I think we should talk to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, then it's like, when they say, if they don't give you a reason, then we should you know, escalate that. But if they, they give you a reason and you accept that reason, then it's all right. But for example, I, 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 the, the reason here is like, uh, to make the code more readable. Did you consider using uh, you know, uh, constants instead of magic numbers to, code, to make the code readable? If they say, well, I consider that, but I don't find this code more readable, and that's all. I would say, why? Why do you think like that? Yeah. So when we have a discussion, and the code review is for everyone, so everyone can contribute, and then as a team we can find a solution, and the co co coding guideline in which we'll say, some authority would say, well, we shouldn't use the, you know, global. We should use constant. Like we shouldn't use magic numbers. But you know. I know that there are devs which are really stubborn, so sometimes it's really hard, so you, I think you should talk to them face-to-face uh, -face if, you, if you can't get any good you know, solution out of them. But, you know, is that answering your question? That's more like an ironic remark. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Well, it's not really an irony because it's like that, that's like that. Uh, also, I, I, I'm going to add, I cannot resist it. I usually hate the word passive aggressive for me, for me to pronounce a, a recent fiction, but I find that you consider, I, I consider it passive aggression. If they reply, I consider it. And, and I mean, one, that typically you, what you get is, did you consider, no, 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 did you consider, no, 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 did you consider, no, 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 and it's so, you know, it's so repetitive that I find it. But what would annoying? Okay. Um, I don't know. What about using constant? It's it's the repetition. Or did you consider that that's for my nerves? Okay. So so the comment is that did you consider it might be annoying when you put a lot of those? I agree. Uh, so you you should vary maybe your comments. Uh, so that it will be more creative than that. Uh, but but the main point is that you shouldn't be offending the dev, so that he will get you know, defensive and he will say, no, I can't fix that, or they won't reply at all and just merge it, or something like that. So that's the main point. Small comment. Uh, whenever um, I have two developers in the same office and a code review is needed, I actually enforce them to, to, talk, to get, uh, talk to each other and uh, sit next to each other. Or if that's not possible, do it on the phone, you know, through some WebEx sharing or something like that, because, you know, that leads to a discussion on the code that's better than these online systems. Because often, you know, the, if you do it offline, um, I don't know, they take less time or they don't look at it in exact detail, but, you know, if they actually talk to each other, they get more ideas about um, how to change the code, how to make it better. Yeah. Well, oftentimes they figure out they don't even need Okay, so, 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 so let me just repeat the comment. So the comment is that it's often better to talk instead of using the tools. Yes. And the question? Uh, what about the other developers on that team that are losing context of the discussion that is available uh, by inline comments? I mean, it depends on the... I mean, if you're in a company, often that you have, um, when you build something, um, I mean, they all have too much to really uh, do other stuff. I mean, it's not really open source, but I can see your point, but I mean, I don't really find in our company that other people are looking at other people's code reviews. That's not really an interesting point. Okay, so, so the comment was that what about other developers which won't be involved in that discussion so that you won't get the guideline for everyone in, for the future. So in my opinion, that, that that's not the perfect solution because then you'll create the common understanding between those two developers, but the company as a, as a team, as a whole, won't have the same understanding and you'll still have the problems later on. Was a question? I just have a comment. Uh, we always try to uh, document the final solution in comments. I mean, uh, when the developers meeting and chatting about the solution, chatting about the problem, and uh, then after that I often ask my uh, colleagues to write the final solution at the code review because it, it is needed for history. Okay, so the comment was that it's uh, also good to have the final solution in the comment afterwards so that it's much easier to follow in the end. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. So when we have the merge request and pull request, we obviously should have a definition of done. Uh, somewhere so that we'll know what has to be done before we can actually merge it because we don't merge uh, you know our stuff ourselves so so what the one thing is that it should be merged by some other authority of our team and all code reviews should be resolved in a sense we shouldn't merge when you know the outstanding things and I don't care I will merge it or, or even worse, where checks are not passing. Like we probably will have like static analyzer, or dynamic analyzer, or tests, or builds. It's like if something is not passing, then we should merge it. But I think that that's obvious. But it's really good to have those check, uh, you know, associated with the merge request, so that you will see immediately whether you can merge or not. So when we have that, uh, when when we when we implement all of that, and someone when we fix all the uh, issues with the, uh, which occurred on the, uh, on the code review, we mark the story as done, and we can move to the next one in priority. And it's important to pair with someone else as well, 
so that you'll share the knowledge between all your team, not just you know you in the silos when two developers are always work together and no one else knows what's going on. So we still have a few minutes. So let's talk about testing and, and C++ 20 and above. What, what we can get out of it? So I think uh, I'm not proposing any, any solution here. I'm just saying that we should maybe consider uh, having stuff like that. So maybe we should have in, in C++ an easy way to run and register the test and have proper assertion system so that all more devs will be encouraged to write the test. Because I think that's one of the problems with the C++ that we don't have facilities to test. So a lot of devs are, well, since community doesn't care, should I? So, you know, it's like when you have something which is built in the language or as a library or anything, then it's much easier to, to just go about it because everyone is doing that because that's part of the language, yeah? But if it's not, well, C++ is really bad with that, in my opinion. We could go a bit further. We could add some like fixtures or suites uh, on top of that, so they'll be easy to test. Uh, we can you know, find really fancy syntax for that uh, in the standard, definitely. And uh, Pete was talking about it already. It would be awesome to have a static reflection in which uh, we would be able to generate uh, the mocks for the interfaces or concepts instead of relying on macros or vtable manipulation or any other hacks. It means that something is missing in the language and I really think that we, we need that in order to, to test properly. So there are a few proposals. There is a static reflection, obviously. Uh, we won't get it soon, uh, I think. We may get some, but we probably won't get enough to do the mocking for 20. Uh, this concept light proposal, so that will fix the templates, but without the reflection, we can't even extract the, what is required for the concept, so that won't help us. And virtual concept uh, is, the, is the proposal for, for the virtual type erasure kind of thing. There's no proposal for testing and assertions accordingly to what I, found, what I didn't find. So maybe we should write one. So to sum up, uh, so good practices are good practices for a reason. It's not that I invented those. I think we should follow uh, most of those, if not all. So we should consider using the testing frameworks instead of writing asserts, because it's really hard to reason about what's going on. It's really hard to run specific tests. We should consider using mocking frameworks because it's much easier to, to test than writing your own kind of fakes or I don't know, or even fake in any other way, which is much difficult. I definitely think that we should consider using writing a solid code instead of a you know, stupid code uh, because this code is just not maintainable and it's really hard for the future to, to improve when you have like technical debt and legacy code extremely hard. I think we should consider using dependency injection framework to simplify the wiring mess and uh, to avoid it actually and to inject mocks automatically so that we, the, you know, the testing won't be that hard to write and it will be much easier for us to reason about testing because you know, from unit test perspective, test should be Unit tests cannot take more than 10 minutes. If it takes more than 10 minutes, it means like you have really bad design because it's too hard to write it. And with TDD, you shouldn't ever get that. And, <laughs> the, and therefore, you should consider writing tests before the implementation. And I'm not saying strictly about TDD here. I'm thinking about acceptance test-driven development, behavior-driven development, and test-driven development all together uh, should be before actually you write the uh, right, the implementation. As I said, it's always cross-functional when it's much easier to, to deliver. And last but not least, uh, you've probably seen that before because Peter used that. Uh, but if you like it, then you should have put a test on it. And it, I think it's like, that's a good, uh, uh, good quote to, to finish. So, so thank you. If you're interested, uh, all those libraries are 
on GitHub, you can take a look into implementation and grab me if you want about, uh, about the implementation details after. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I have more like comments. Uh, and I, I generally do things the way you describe about unit testing, but I have at least two very concrete situations in which I felt that doing things that way uh, was not the right way. So maybe I'm going to split it. Situation one, situation two, okay? So the, the first situation I have in mind, uh, I, I wrote several iterations of an object relational mapper in Perl and in C++. The version is open source, it's called Tangram. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of testing because it's a complex subject. Matter was quite powerful, it did collections and, and so on. Uh, so I could have mocked the database uh, and uh, checked that uh, the mapper was trying to send the right SQL to the database. Uh, and I think that those tests would have you know, followed the orthodoxy that would have been worthless. Uh, I really felt that I needed a real relational database to first check that the SQL that was generated was correct, not something I had written myself, and that it did the right thing to the tables and so on. Okay, um, so, so because I won't be able to repeat. So, so, so the comment was that uh, there are cases when, uh, when TDD might be harmful, that what uh, you kind of tried to describe? What I'm saying here is that Mocks are nice, but sometimes, especially if you're mocking something complex, like a relational database, which is used in the context of object relational mapping, uh, you're probably going to get your mock behaviors wrong. Uh, in that case, uh, I did unit testing, except that you would call it integration testing. And I felt that it was a much better approach to testing the thing okay. than mocking. Okay, so, so, so the comment was that the uh, unit testing might not be a solution for everything. Integration test sometimes it's better. Mm. So, well, I never said that unit testing is the, the solution. And for me, you should do acceptance test driven development, behavior driven development, and test driven development together. So you start from ATDD, as I said, like with the cucumber. Mm. After that, you write your implementation with TDD. And on top of that, you do integration tests. But the, the TDD and unit tests will give you Something else, as I said, uh, easily to run uh, documentation and verify what's going on, as well as you'll spot uh, failures easier. So if you have integration tests, awesome, but if, you, if they fail, it's extremely hard to find out what's going on because you d it's really hard to check you know, mm, the corner cases in integration tests, yeah? Because you have a lot of uh, things and sometimes you can't get even into that state easily. And with TDD and unit tests, you can easily verify those states. So that's the value of unit testing. But I, I would never release myself a code which just have unit tests, because I think that's not enough. Uh, I have to have something which will uh, test the behavior so that I can say it actually works. So I would combine those. Uh, I think we mostly really agree except that uh, at the very beginning you said that integration the testing should be something done by architects. There, I disagree. Sometimes it depends. So, and pro probably most of the time, I'm on the same page as you. But sometimes, like in the case I explained, uh, uh, unit testing, the generation of SQL using mocks, would have actually tested almost nothing. I really had to send the thing, the string to, to the real, to, to real database. I think that anything else would have been worthless. But if you have to test with a real database, does it have to be that exact same database that you would use in production? Do you have uh, to spin up a giant cluster with an Oracle database, or could you use an in-memory SQLite database with predictable information? Okay, so uh, actually uh, I tested with seven or eight of them, because their behavior can... And I, I agree that here we're a bit beyond just purely unit testing, even if I don't really have database. There is a bit of pragmatism in it. But yeah. the point of uh, marking something out is that you reduce your dependencies on things that you cannot control, and it will make your test fail outside of your realm of control. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be dependent on a network connection to a giant server that may have data that somebody else put in that now is going to make your test fail. Or the network connection drops out, or it's overloaded, or 15 other things. Well, I, I put the data so those are the risks that you're trying to, uh, trying to cover. 
Yeah, I, I put the data in it myself. And it is true that it's annoying that uh, I have to make sure that all those databases are running. You have Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, and, and whatnot on my machine. It was annoying. Uh, but but what I like that you use the word pragmatism. I think that, that that's my point, actually. That generally I agree with what you said, and generally I do it that way, but, that's, but it, it mustn't become a dogma. Yeah, so, well, it's hard to repeat that comment. I, I think that Pete, uh, actually man <laughs> Pete, Pete mentioned an important thing, though, that testing has to be predictable. If you have anything which is not predictable, you, you shouldn't test it. Uh, in integration tests or, or um, unit tests, because you, the idea is that you get the feedback early and quickly. So if you have time, if you have unit tests or integration tests, which depends on time, that's a not good test, because you will struggle with having a flaky yeah. test. I, I, I would also argue that, that you know, even if that is uh, needed to test your scenario, you probably should have some at least you know, rudimentary unit tests because you can put them on a continuous integration system to make sure people don't break you later. Mm -hmm. Whereas the database is not going to be running on Travis or Jenkins or something. Uh, yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, I, I'm, but I'm saying that uh, you can get into the illusion that you tested, you need tested your code very well, and yeah. then you run into yeah. mocking bugs. Yeah. yeah. Well, unit testing on its own is not enough. That, I think that's the comment. Yeah, well, yeah, we agree on that. Any other comments? Questions? Maybe line number two? Okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. You had a comment that you said that there was no proposal yet for having a testing framework or testing standard uh, solution. Do you think that's a thing that we should have? So, so the question is that uh, I said that I couldn't find any proposal for the integration uh, for the testing and assertions in <coughs> the in the still. I and I think we should have something like that because that that would encourage developers to test, because testing has to be easy. If, you ha if, if the struggle is that you don't have framework immediately, for some, it's the barrier which you can't get over. And I think we should encourage everyone to test. And I think that would make it more consistent across everyone, and it would make it much easier. But that would make you have a giant standard set of libraries, which means that all the other libraries are second-rate second add-ons, as in, like, what C Sharp has. Well, I'm not, uh, yeah, so, th so the comment was that you would have too much in the standard, uh, in basically, so I wouldn't put everything in the standard. I wouldn't maybe put the mocking library in the standard or something like that. I would make the facilities to make it easier, and I would definitely put something where I can, like in D, I can run the tests immediately or something, or have an assertion instead of just C assert, which is totally pointless for testing. Yeah, I know. Uh, I wanted to note that uh, the fact that you can't mock a uh, singleton is not entirely true. Um, like, uh, if you are in odd situations where you absolutely have to statically link everything, um, then you can model a singleton as like a static member variable of a class that's found via traits, and then you specialize the traits in order to mock it. Okay. Yeah, so the comment is that. If you really want, you can test singletons. Yeah, if you really want, you can test all of this code, with that, like private, public, define private, public, linking, like magic or anything. Yeah. It's just harder. And in my opinion, when it's hard, I won't do it because I can't be asked because it's too difficult. And I don't want to maintain a lot of tests. I will just write one, which is big. And when it fails, a lot of times, I don't care. I will just comment it out and uh, release it. You could also just mark out the instance function of the singleton. Yeah. Since it's just free function, you can mark those. Yeah. yeah, singletons on its own, they may exist as long as they are, for example, injected, yeah? So then they can, you can just easily change well, what is it, yeah, for the test. So singletons on their own, they not necessarily a pure evil, but if you use them like an evil, like a logger, then, then, then it's difficult to test that. Well, I mean, they're, they're stupid for other reasons, too. Like yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah, and static initialization. Yeah. Yeah, it's like so, uh... Another situation in which I didn't do things that way, uh, I wrote a, a library that implements uh, open multi methods. And it's, it's all about, it's mostly about data structures and algorithms. Eventually, you have to build a uh, compressed multi dimensional dispatch table. And uh, in, along the way, you have to topological sort, uh, hierarchies of classes, and blah, blah, blah. 
So uh, in that case, I have a lot of tests, but they, they actually test the state of the data structure. I don't think that anything would have been gained by mocking the data structure and check that at some point the algorithm, say, the algorithm says uh, at position 0, 0, 007 set this value. No, instead I just generated the table and tested the table. Uh, so th I guess the comment is that unit testing is not enough still, or? Uh, well, no, if, if I would sum it, uh, the gist of it is that uh, at one point, uh, mocking and uh, behavior driven testing, or I think that, that, that's what it's called, became very popular and sort of uh, displaced uh, state uh, driven testing. And uh, again, I, I think that um, uh, we need to consider both. Uh, sometimes some data structures of the state of an object is going to be very important. A lot of the complexity of the code will be reflected in the fact that an object has to be in a certain state. And uh, it, I think that we must be open and, and not forget that sometimes the right thing to do is, is to test the state, not the behavior. Or that it will be more efficient to test the state instead of attempting to mock objects and, uh, and test such function has been called with such value. Uh, again, it's a plea for open mind. Yeah, so, so I guess the comment is that you have to be pragmatic towards testing yeah. and not always unit testing is the best or integration tests or acceptance tests are the best solution for... for, for, for okay, so mocking in particular. Mocking is, is often the right thing to do, but sometimes testing the state is, is a better way of writing your tests. Sometimes. Yeah, the, the, I, think, I would still argue that there is a value in TDD uh, in, in unit testing, uh, but I think we can take it after because that will be a long discussion. Uh, are there any questions? All right, thank you.